Hey guys, Cameron from Audi C7 Owners, coming back with a quick video for you guys. Uh, I've been gone for a little while, so that's why I haven't had a video uh, recently. Took a little family vacation, uh, but I'm here with a new video to talk about oil leaks and oil consumption. Reference your 3OT supercharged engine. Uh, real quick, if you find my videos helpful, please like and subscribe. Leave some comments below on what you like or what you have questions about. Also, if you're on Instagram, please go to Instagram at Audi C7 Owners and give us a follow there. We're still trying to get to 2,000 uh, follows on Instagram, so we can give some test pipes from Can Auto Performance. So uh, anyways, let's jump into the topic today. I've got my handy dandy list written on a piece of cardboard because that's uh, what I had in the garage. But I've been seeing a lot of people on the Facebook Audi C7 owners group asking randomly, you know, hey, I've got oil consumption or hey, I think I've got an oil leak. I'm, you know, burning a liter every 1500 miles, every 2000 miles. So I, I wanna talk a bit about oil consumption in the vehicle, common places for oil leaks, what you need to look for, and how, how this all works with the 3OT engines. And this will apply to the B8 and B8.5 S4s as well as your SQ5s. So the first thing, let's talk about normal oil consumption. Um, Audi says that a liter uh, every 2,000 miles is normal, I think. That's what people have been told, and that, that's absolutely not correct. Uh, these cars, when they are running correctly and in good uh, working order, should not be burning hardly any oil inside of 5,000 miles. By the way, for all you people that don't live in the United States, I'm sorry, I'm not converting this to like kilometers. Uh, I'm just not going to. Hopefully you guys can bear with me on that one. Somebody complained about that, about us saying miles per hour instead of kilometers per hour. But in any case, uh, a liter every 5,000 miles, that's about normal if you're burning a, a liter about every 5,000 miles. Uh, also, the intervals on these cars, I think I talked about this in my OBD11 video about resetting the interval. They say the oil change should be good for 10,000 miles. If your car is perfectly stock and you're just using it as a daily driver, then yeah, you can get away with that. But I would highly suggest moving your oil change intervals to change your oil every 5,000 miles for the longevity of this engine. It'll, it'll just last you a lot longer if you move to that. So. Um, in terms of oil consumption that you start need to be concerned of. If you start seeing that you're putting in a liter of oil every like 3,000 miles, that's where you wanna start looking at things. And the first thing you wanna think about is the type of oil you're using. If you're using Mobile One or Castrol or you know your typical advanced auto parts, off the shelf kind of stuff, then you need to start thinking about moving to a higher quality engine oil. And when I say higher quality, I'm talking about Rova, Liquid Molly or Motul 8100 Excess. Uh, those are the three that I have ran in this car and they've all performed extremely well and given me a really good longevity in terms of oil change intervals. Uh, and they've maintained the viscosity over the interchange, or I'm sorry, over the interval of having the uh, oil in the car. Uh, right now I'm running Liquid Molly just because I got it from FCP Euro, but it's like I said, Motul 81 Excess, fantastic oil. Liquid Molly, good oil. Rova, good oil. So those three you're gonna be good with. So if you're using a kind of not as good oil, try to switch to one of those if you're seeing oil consumption and you should see a significant improvement in that. Uh, if your oil is a little bit older, so like let's say you haven't driven 5,000 miles but you've gone six months, go ahead and think about changing it out as well because the longer it runs, the less viscosity it has. <clears throat> um, so we're gonna focus on leaks first and then move into types or issues that'll cause oil consumption. So before you do anything, you need to assess if you have a leak, right? Now a lot of people say, hey, I think of an oil leak, but I don't see anything. Obviously, first thing you wanna do is get underneath the car after it's sat for a little while and see if you have any visible signs of a leak. Now you do have pans that cover the entire bottom of this car, so if there's a very small oil leak, it'll drip to that pan and likely settle on that pan and won't reach the actual floor of your garage or your driveway. So you're probably gonna to need to take off those pans and take a flashlight and get under there and look. Now, real quick, Liquid Molly does have a version of Liquid Molly that has a black light reactant uh, chemical in the oil that you can get under there with a black light flashlight and look around and it'll show you exactly where it's leaking from. So if you really think you have an oil leak, that might be a good thing to throw into your car so you can trace it back to the point of origin. So if you get under there, you take your pans off and you don't see any kind of a leak on the ground or you don't see anything on your oil pan indicating you have a steady leak going all over the ground, you need to start moving to some other places. Uh, after you look at that, look at your drain plug whenever you are underneath there. Um, I'm kind of backtracking here. Go to your drain plug. If you're changing your oil via your drain plug or you're having your oil changed from somebody that uses the drain plug and not a fill tool, then that drain plug, if it's not replaced, that OEM one is a soft metal. And the more you take it out and put it back in, the more it will deconform or whatever, it'll disfigure, and that can lead to an oil leak. Now, obviously you'll see signs of that around the oil plug, 
with a drain plug and you'll see it on your pan. So that can be a first one. If you ever do it that way, make sure you're always changing it with an OEM one or replace it with an aftermarket one that has a magnet on the end to catch any kind of metal debris that may be floating around in your oil. Um, so after that, you want to start looking at some other things that are on the upper side of the engine. Uh, the first one I would check out is going to be your oil filter uh, housing. And we're talking about not only the housing, kind of like the shell that you pull off whenever you change your oil filter, because that unscrews, right? You're going to pull that off. And the first thing you need to check are for cracks. Those are plastic housings. And if somebody over tightens them and torques them too hard, it can crack those housings. The ones that come off the, uh, we'll call it the bell housing if you want to. Um, it can crack that. And if it cracks, you're going to leak oil. Um, there's also two separate uh, gaskets that go into that bell housing. Well, only one goes into the bell housing and that's the one that has a little tab. You have to use a needle nose to kind of pull out. There's also one that goes where the bell housing fits over to the foil filter housing itself that connects to the engine. There's a gasket there that a lot of people miss when they do their uh, oil change. And if that gets loose, it's going to leak oil. So make sure when you're doing your oil changes, you're getting both of those gaskets replaced. Now, a little bit deeper of a dive, but also relating to the oil filter housing, the oil filter housing where it actually comes down and connects to the engine block. There's a, there's a gasket there and it's not easy to get to. That's extensive. That's removing you know, your supercharger and getting down into the engine. It's, it's pretty difficult to change. I have seen, and it's, it's not a common thing, that it's more rare than not, but that it's a gasket. You know, It can wear down over time and if it goes bad, it will leak and that kind of leaks at the back of the center valley of the engine. Okay, And so it'll be kind of difficult to tell because it can be such a slow leak that as the engine's hot and it burns, it can burn off the oil before it reaches the ground. So if you're not finding any visible signs of an oil leak, you know, from your typical inspection stuff, that could be something to look into. Um, moving on from the oil filter housing and the bell housing there, your chain, uh, your timing chain covers. You have two covers on the top of the motor, and then you have covers on the bottom of the motor. You might need to take your car to an actual shop to have them put on a lift to inspect this. You're probably going to have to remove your intake on that side. You're going to have to get behind the engine and really look. The, um, you can find, and hopefully I'll have a picture of the back of this engine so you can see what I'm talking about. But those gaskets, those are, I think they're RTV sealant, but over time they can wear out and oil can slip out the back of the engine as well. Uh, you should be able to see the lower chain covers um, if it's up on a lift or you can get up there and get underneath your car without your covers on and, and look up there. That's where that black light reactant uh, oil from liquid Molly will probably help you. But those are fairly common, not, not super common, but fairly common in terms of oil leaks, having oil leaking from the back of those timing chain covers, either the upper ones or the lower ones. Uh, after that, you want to look at your valve cover gaskets. Now, on the all right, real quick side note, uh, looks like I actually might have a valve cover gasket leak. I was catching some B footage for the video and I was in here and actually looking around and inspecting, seeing what I could see while I was just doing an inspection from the top of the engine. And it looks like I've got a little bit, it's a very small leak, but it does look like I've got some uh, oil buildup on the driver's side uh, valve cover gasket near the front of the engine. Let me get this flipped around and I'll show you guys what I see. All right, so if we come over here towards the front and bottom of the valve cover gasket, uh, if you look right there, you can see what I'm talking about right there in the hot spot. And then if I come around to the back, you can see some other grime and build up down there. And that's very typical oil uh, leak signs. It turns into this kind of brown sludge that catches dirt and debris. And while I don't have the cleanest engine, I still make sure that it's clean of uh, oil. Um, that's not in any place that oil would spill and get to. So uh, looks like you guys will be seeing a valve cover gasket change DIY video coming up in the near future. These engines, valve cover gasket leaks aren't incredibly common like like, you know, your two liter turbo FSI engines in the early Mark V GTIs. That was just a common thing. And you knew after 70,000 miles, you're gonna to have to do your valve cover gasket. Uh, on these engines, I don't see it talked about too often, but it's an easy thing that you can pretty much do at home if you're pretty handy around this engine. Like if you can take your supercharger off, you can absolutely change your valve cover gaskets. Uh, so that's something to look into. A lot of people have talked about when they remove their coil packs and they remove their spark plugs or change, they'll find a little bit of oil on the inside of their, uh, well, on their coil packs a little trace amount of oil on your coil pack is actually fairly normal. Uh, if you're having a lot of oil when you do that, then you have an issue. But uh, that's another area that you wanna check for oil leaks. Um, after that, in terms of other places, there, there's not too much else for an oil leak to occur on these cars. Um, the thing about everything that I've talked about that's on the engine is if the engine's hot, you should smell oil when the car is just at idle. 
slowly burning off. Um, if you're having an oil leak of that kind, you should be able to smell it. If you're having oil consumption, but you're not smelling oil burning off anywhere, then you need to start look at actual oil consumption in terms of combustion of oil inside the motor going out through your exhaust. And there's basically three main culprits for this. Your first one, and this is a common failure of this vehicle, is your PCV. If your PCV fails, you will burn oil like crazy. And we're talking probably having to put a liter in every 1500 miles or so. Um, it, the PCV should throw a code on your, uh, you know, on your ECU, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, so that's the first thing and you can kind of do an at home test to see if it's failed if you're not getting the code by trying to turn the car on and then opening up your engine cap and if it's got a large amount of suction where it's, it's difficult to pull away from the engine then your PCV is definitely failing. It also might have a whistle. That's a little more common in the 40T engines, but it does happen on these. A, a high-pitched whistle can come from a failing PCV, um, but on the 30Ts, it's it's not that common. Uh, another issue with the PCV, along like with oil consumption, uh, there's a, a breather tube that connects from the top of the PCV, and it goes all the way up and connects to the back of the supercharger. That has a check valve on it. And if that check valve gets stuck open, it will also burn oil. Even if the PCV is good, if that check valve gets stuck, if that fails, you will also burn oil. And I've seen people have that part fail only and still result in having to add a liter every 1500 to 2000 miles. So make sure when you ch change the uh, PCV, you're also changing that inline filter. It's super easy to change. I mean, you take it off when you take the supercharger off anyways. Um, you, you, so, you know, I've talked about it in our PCV tips and tricks video. And if you wanna know more about it, you can go over there and check out that video but definitely change them both when you change the PCV. After the PCV if you're having oil consumption then unfortunately with these engines it's one of two issues that are a really in-depth fix. Uh, the one that everyone talks about is piston ring failure and if you're not familiar with these engines and all newer engines pretty much use a uh, well, loose tension piston rings uh, or floating piston rings and it allows the engines to to move the pistons much faster generate more horsepower but the problem is those piston rings allow carbon to build up behind them if the maintenance isn't very isn't correct on these if you're using bad oil or letting your oil just go way too long before you change it things like that carbon will build up there and those piston rings won't be able to actually do their job and then you're going to have oil blow by or seepage through the piston and it's going to get into the combustion chamber it's going to detonate and then it's going to burn out you might not see burning oil uh, because if you have catalytic converters, the catalytic converters are going to capture most of that burning oil. And this starts a chain of events that just you don't want to go down. Um, so if you don't, if you're not familiar, burning oil out of your exhaust comes out as blue smoke like a light blue smoke. Uh, if you have just regular gray or black smoke, that's carbon burning. That's not really anything you have to worry about too much. But when you have that blue smoke and you'll smell it, it smells like burning oil, uh, that's obviously burning oil. Now, if you have white smoke, you're burning coolant somehow, and that's a whole other issue. We're gonna do another video on coolant loss uh, in the near future. Um, if you don't have a lot of catalytic converters or you have gutted cats or you have test pipes, whatever, then you should see that blue smoke coming out. Uh, if you have piston ring failure under hard acceleration and wide open throttle, deceleration, whatever, you should see that blue smoke as you are accelerating. Um, that requires either an engine rebuild, so you have to pull the motor out, have someone tear it down to the pistons, replace the piston rings, check to make sure nothing's damaged on the inside of the cylinder walls, all that jazz. Um, and honestly, with these motors, it's more cost beneficial to just get a very good used engine to swap in. That's less labor time, and you could pretty much usually take your engine out and part it out and recoup a good amount of your money when it comes to buying a used engine. Um, if you can do it at home, even better. You're saving all that labor time. Uh, a used engine can go anywhere from 3000 to five and a half thousand dollars but when you're talking about tearing the motor out tearing it down rebuilding it if you're only having to replace the piston rings come back you're easily looking probably at five to seven thousand dollars if not more so most people just opt with swapping in a used engine um, the other and this is a little bit less common uh, issue but uh, I think this is what's going on with my car the uh, exhaust valve stem seals. Um, if you're not familiar with your valve stems and whatnot, there's an exhaust side and an intake side and there's seals for the exhaust side there. And if those break down, you're, you will have oil seep by them and it will detonate in combustion on deceleration. That's the thing about the exhaust valve stem seals. If you're doing a wide open throttle pull, you really shouldn't see any blowing back, like, or um, blowing blue smoke. 
But when you're decelerating, especially from higher RPMs, as you come to a rest, you'll start to see blue smoke come out. Another sign of this is if the car's been sitting for a while and you go to turn it on on a cold start, you'll probably see blue smoke come out of your exhaust pipes, especially if you, know, you don't have catalytic converters. And I've got gutted cats on mine. Um, this is what's happening with my car. I only have blue smoke come out of the exhaust on deceleration. And it's typically when I do a high RPM rev match. So if I bounce my RPMs up to like 5,500 and let it just engine brake all the way down, then rev, you know, rev match and downshift again, I'll see just a good amount of blue smoke come out of my car. And it sucks because it always happens when I come to a stoplight and then everybody gets smoked out from my exhaust. Uh, the reason that this happens, and this is a theory of mine, I don't know for sure, but um, my car, my catalytic converter on my driver's side failed and it got blocked up. So I didn't have flow through it. And so it, I'll, I'll do the, another video on catalytic converter failure later on. But the, the short story is it, it broke down, it uh, got compacted in there. I didn't have flow through the exhaust. And anytime I try and get on the accelerator, the car would recognize that it was just building back pressure too much and it would go into limp mode. But you know, that one before I was getting into like three and a half, four thousand RPM. So what I think is happening, my theory here is that back pressure build and then that back pressure built too much, it caused damage to the exhaust valve stem seals. And that is why I've got uh, exhaust seal failure now. Um, your catalytic converters on these cars are the major weak point. And if you are, you know, if you're modified and you're really throwing a lot of extra horsepower at it, you're gonna have your catalytic converters fail even faster. And so it all just works in tune with each other here on this car, unfortunately. Um, but that's why I think mine have failed, uh, simply because my, well, why my exhaust valve stem seals failed, because I had that back pressure and that lasted for about eight or nine months before I figured out exactly what was going on. And so that's where I think I'm at. The positive way to identify if you have piston ring failure or valve stem seal failure is to get a leak down test performed. You can do a compression test and that'll tell you like, yeah, there's something inside the engine that's not holding pressure. It doesn't tell you exactly what though. And a lot of people go and get a compression test and like, oh, my valves, my uh, piston rings are done. Maybe, but it might be your exhaust, exhaust valve stem seals. And to replace your exhaust valve stem seals, some people have said you can do it with the engine in the car, but it's, it's a lot more difficult. But with those, Pulling the motor out, yeah, it's an issue, but once it's out, it's really easy to go in there and swap those out if you have the right tools. And when I say easy, I don't mean like your average DIY mechanic at home, like I don't really even want to attempt that, but it's something that I would take over to us, like my local shop to have them do and go ahead and bite the bullet and pay the money to do that instead of swapping a motor in. Now you could potentially get a used motor, put it in there, pull your old motor out and take your sweet time rebuilding it at home if you want to. And then you have an extra engine or you could turn around and sell that for, you know, hey, I've got a, you know, engine that I've done the exhaust valve stem seals. I've also, you know, while you're in there, do the timing chains, your uppers and lowers, whole nine yards. You know, if you know your engine's pretty healthy and you do all that crazy maintenance, that's gonna be a valuable engine to somebody. So, so that's an option for you. Um, so yeah, to, to recap and in this video, when it comes to oil leaks, drain plug, Check to make sure that's good. Make sure you're swapping that out. Uh, after your drain plug, we're gonna look at your um, chain covers. That's timing chain covers and the uppers. Those fail a little bit more often than the lower chain cover. So check those. After that valve cover gasket, make sure those aren't leaking. And then your oil filter bell housing as well as the oil filter housing itself. Make sure all those gaskets are in good working order and make sure your bell housing isn't cracked. After that, when it comes to consumption, PCV, that's gonna be, uh, everybody's gonna have to deal with that if you have one of these cars long-term. So that's your number one culprit. And then beyond that, we're talking about getting compression and a leak down test to determine if your piston rings or your exhaust valve stem seals are uh, compromised. So I uh, hope this video helps you guys and trying to determine what your oil consumption is. Uh, just make sure if you are using kind of not as good oil, go ahead and that should be your first thing after you check for leaks, switch to a much better oil, Liquid Molly, Motul, Rova, change to something like that and see if that doesn't improve your performance. There are additives and things like that. And I really don't want to get into the additives just because we can spend all day talking about different company and different additives. Liquid Molly makes additives that a lot of people swear by. Um, BG Performance makes really good additives. I actually use those in my car and, and those, those help. There's a video on that. But um, yeah, if you guys have any questions or comments, drop them below, like and subscribe, and we will see you on the next video.